Hello, everyone. How are you doing? <clears throat> Yay! I like that energy. I like it, I like it, I like it. So, for the past three years, diversity, inclusion, and the surrounding conversation have permeated all walks of life, and that includes the world of fashion. But Emma Greed has done business under that philosophy since the start. After launching her own entertainment marketing company, ITB, at the tender age of 24, Emma launched Good American with Khloe Kardashian in 2016. Ever since, they've lived up to the promises they made, basing decisions on female empowerment, inclusion, and sustainable production, not just profit. She'll be speaking with Samira Nasser, editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar. Please welcome Emma and Samira to the stage. They're both in fashion, so they're fashionably late. <laughs> See what I did there? So I get paid the big bucks. <laughs> oh, do you want me to talk a little more? Oh, yeah, I'm more than happy to do that. So where shall we begin? <laughs> uh, what have you all enjoyed thus far? Please feel free to chime in. I won't call on names. I'll just look longingly at people and hope that you respond to my queries. What have you enjoyed so far? What has resonated with you? Um, what do you how do you think I'm doing? Constance. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. I really enjoyed Angela's talk and the ideas that she brought forth and then Verizon speak how they are really, I really appreciate and I'm going to look into this more deeply, yeah. how they are trying to make this a more equitable world in terms of digital connectivity. I think that's so important. Very important. And I, and I was shocked to hear, you know, he was talking about right here in the United States. Yes, yes, we are. That's so connected to disadvantaged people having the opportunity to keep up and be part of the economy. I mean, the idea of having to do homework on your parents' phone is devastating. So whatever Diego and his lovely team can do to make a difference is, uh, is something that we all need to celebrate, promote, and speak about more. All right, the gentleman here with the cool socks. Yeah. Tell me what you've enjoyed thus far. Well, I really like the conversation around AI. It's one of the number one things that, uh, I'm in education, I'm chair of fashion in Detroit. And um, it's the number one thing we are discussing at the moment, and it's super interesting to hear from these thought leaders what their point of view is, and it seems like we need to embrace it rather than ban it. That's true. It can be a bit terrifying. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie, but I feel actually I found solace in this conversation, so I'm glad that it resonated with you as well. We have to embrace it because we can't be Luddites and bury our head in the sand or or we will be obsolete. Okay, gang, what, let's hear from this side of the room. What have you enjoyed over there in the mix? I see you. I love Constance, Constance, yes. My ringer's in the front row, my gorgeous ringer, yes. So Constance and I actually go way back. Um, years ago, I was a, an arts and leisure reporter for the New York Times. And prior to landing that job, I met with a gorgeous woman who rocks a black turtleneck like no other, Constance White. She was there first, and she helped usher me through the times and, and has been a phenomenal mentor and friend and muse ever since. They're telling me that I've got to get to the next segment, and I will, but really quickly in a nutshell, my name's Lola Ganike. I'm a veteran, a journalist, um, definitely not Gen Alpha, but you know, <laughs> with the right makeup and lighting, I can give you a little millennial. <laughs> vintage millennial. Um, I've been in the industry for well over a decade, vintage millennial, <laughs> and um, 
I've written for a number of publications. I mentioned the New York Times. I've written for everyone from Rolling Stone to Architectural Digest. My current story is an Architectural Digest magazine. It's a profile of the artist Kehinde Wiley. He's most known for painting Barack Obama, the presidential portrait. And that's my latest piece currently on newsstands. Pick it up. Um, I am a diehard print person, but encouraged and excited about the future of my profession. And now it is time for me to go. <laughs> Samira Nasir, a print girl, Harper's Bazaar, Emma Green with the fashion and the skins and the G. Thank you. Oh God, we got stairs. Hi everyone. Look at that. Hi everyone. Hi, Don't everyone. think we were divas. It was a mic issue. Yeah, it wasn't us. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> You're like that. Woo! Yeah. Hi, Elegant. Everyone. Oh, gosh. I, I will find my bearings. Hi. Hi, my dear. How are you? I'm great. I'm really happy to be in this room with everyone. Um, so, yeah, this is nice. I'm going to get going. I need a timer because we're going to just go on too long. Will some... Because <gasps> we're going to go on too long. Is that so my timer? So many people I love here. Hi, hi, hi. Um, so I'm going to just, yeah take you all in, and then I'm going to jump right in because we don't have a ton of time. Um, so I do want to start with, um, it occurs to me that when we get to these spaces, um, we oftentimes imagine that we've just arrived and there wasn't a journey that brought us there. <laughs> um, and I know you have a really interesting one. So I'd love to start with your journey, your trajectory in um, getting to this place of success. Yeah, it's a great question. How far do you want me to go back? I start, I was 14 and I had a paper round. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> That's see, where it all starts, see? though. Um, you know, it's so funny because I feel like I turned 40 last year and there's like something about turning 40 that everyone was like, wow, are you 40 years old? And I was like, yeah, I've been around for like a really long time doing things that nobody cared about. <laughs> and all of a sudden it's like, you know, like you suddenly appeared. But, um, you know, I feel like, I started my career really wanting to be in fashion. That was my mm -hmm. love and that's what I grew up really like admiring and thinking about all the time. And then I realized that I wasn't an especially creative person. What I was good at doing was working with really creative people and finding ways to like bridge that creativity. And so I've done a lot of things. I've had a lot of companies. I've had mm -hmm. a lot of uh, failures and things that didn't work out so well. But um, I really have never lost enthusiasm for wanting to do my own thing. And I think the most important thing that I've learned is a lot of resilience because mm -hmm. I've had a ton of I guess just things in my life that didn't work out as I thought they would. I had businesses that I had much bigger hopes and aspirations for or ideas that I couldn't really get off the ground. And so when I moved to L.A., what is it, coming up for six years now, that, you know, for Good American, that was honestly the first time I had smelt or touched even an iota of success. It really was, you know, the first moment for me. And that was... Um, an interesting moment because I had zero aspiration to live in LA. You know, I thought LA was full of people not working, quite frankly. Wow. Um, there, there is that. <laughs> you know, I thought it was a place for entertainment and where nothing mm -hmm. else happened. And I was like, I'll go here for three years and I'll see how this thing kind of works out. And, um, and lo and behold, it worked out pretty well. Um, I want to talk a little bit about successful entrepreneurs. And I'd love to know from your perspective, what is the greatest strength that you think um, sets successful entrepreneurs apart? And a follow-up to that would be, you know, now that you've had this trajectory, what do you think your greatest strength is? Um, you know, I always think about it in terms of like something around this idea of resilience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was raised, I'm a raised by a single mom, one of four girls, and I was really brought up to understand that, you know, I had great, a, a great amount of confidence, a lot of self-assurance. You know, my mum was like, you know, you're not better than anyone else, but neither is anyone else better mm -hmm. than you. And that really stayed with me throughout my life. It's something that I've always thought about. You know, I used to have a bit of insecurity about having a lack of, like, formal education. I was like, no, like, I'm just doing what everybody else is doing. I'm just trying to get through the day. I think that my strength is, you know, I know 
who I am. Mm -hmm. I know where I come from and I'm really clear about where I'm going. And I've always been like that. I've been very, very clear um, about my journey. And I've never really wavered from the fact like I, I came out like wanting to be successful and I was unashamedly kind of forthright about it. I was like, I need to make a lot of money. I would really like to do something that's commercially big and successful and touches lots of people. And um, just sometimes, I guess, like putting it out there and not being so secretive about it was was a good thing for me. Well, there's something interesting in that, in that I think especially for girls and women, that you somehow can't own that. Yeah, and also especially for black women, right? Yeah. Because it comes yeah. across like, yeah. oh, she's bullshit. Like, yeah, she's yeah, a little yeah, yeah, yeah. full of herself. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I'm just broke. Like, yeah. no, it's just facts. <laughs> it was just facts, you know? And so, and I just thought to myself, it's, it, it's always it's always been really good for me. And mm -hmm. I've had a lot of people in my career that said, you know, you shouldn't really speak about money like that. Remember, I'm English, and so you don't talk about that. But for me, I was brazen about it. I had like a you know, 20 plan, I had a 30 plan, I have a 40 plan, I have a 50 plan now. And it was always very orientated around, well, this is what I needed to do. And this is where I'd like a company to be. And this is what I'd like to take out of the situation. Oh, wow. And I think being that focused has actually been, it's been helpful for me, for me sorting through things that I wouldn't do, mm -hmm. as opposed to what I would do. As a successful black female entrepreneur, how do you navigate and challenge stereotypes and biases in both your personal and professional life. I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a little bit unaware of it. I have to say, you have to remember that I'm English. And so there's a very, very different culture of how we speak about these things yeah. and how they're brought to your attention. It wasn't until I moved to this country that anybody ever asked me about being a black woman in business. Like, never never in my career, and I'd done lots of interviews in my past, and, you know, when those questions are levelled at you, I'm kind of looking around the room being like, who are you talking about? So I never thought of, you know, that being something that I needed to confront mm -hmm. until I came to America, and mm -hmm. then I really thought about um, just being constantly irked by this idea of that there was some, you know, bucket that I was supposed to fall into and something I was supposed to say to everybody when my experience was very, very different. I think about it all the time now because I'm asked about it all the time. And I think that understanding what it's like for a lot of people in this country where we're talking about not, um, you know, just systemic racism. We're talking about people being historically left out of the conversation, yeah. whether that's funding conversations, mm -hmm. whether that's opportunity conversations. But we're really talking about a different level mm -hmm. of uh, ex people being excluded. And so for me, it's like I'm not an Instagram activist. I thought, like, what can I actually do about this situation and how can I be, you know, really active? And that's where my role around the 15% pledge came because, quite frankly, I was bored of being another person on Instagram getting really upset about mm -hmm. things that were happening. And so I thought this would be a great opportunity to actually put my money where my mouth is and use my contacts and use my resources and use what it is that I've learned from building these businesses to actually affect some real change. Why should everyone in this room care about the 15% pledge? Well, you know, because it's tangible. You know, what I love, you know, I've worked in non-profit for over 10 years and sometimes you can feel like you're pushing water up a hill. Mm -hmm. The problems get worse and worse and worse. And what I love about the pledge, and for those of you that don't know about the 15% pledge, we are a, a, a non-profit organisation that centres all of its work around racial equity. We're essentially saying black people make up 15% of the population of this country and therefore retailers should allocate 15% of their spend towards black owned businesses. And in a little over three years, we've become the fastest growing non-profit in the country. We've created a $14 billion pipeline of opportunity for black owned businesses. But tangibly, what does that mean? It actually means that over 700 brands are on the shelves of the retailers that have taken the pledge than before we started. Mm -hmm. And so it really is moving the conversation forward and you don't you know take the pledge and make a promise to like hopefully support black owned brands it's actually a contractual commitment and it's a years long contractual commitment 10 years in the case of a brand like Nordstrom so we're really actually helping not only usher the right brands into the space who aren't given the room to be there in the mm -hmm. first place but we're making sure that there is a life cycle for them within those retailers and that they can be successful and the conditions are created for them to, for them to be successful in those spaces 
And how do you take that and create more equity within the business landscape for, for other groups that are left out? Like, what can we all take from that in terms of navigating equity in a, in a, in a business landscape? Well, I think that, you know, oftentimes what I hear is that everybody wants to do something, mm -hmm. but people just are not sure what they can do, yeah. right? That like we can all do something. We can all support businesses that we wouldn't ordinarily. We can all go out of our way to be vocal and, you know, not just buy from those businesses, but support them from a marketing point of view. But for me, it's really about what we do within our organisations. There's a lot of power in this room, a lot of decision makers in this room. And I really take the point of view that you have to change absolutely everything from your hiring practices. You know, if you walk into your office and everybody looks exactly like you, you have a problem. That's not a problem about racial justice. That's a problem from a business point of view, right? Yes. It's like we need other points of view. We need different ages and ethnicities and everyone around the table to mm -hmm. make do good decisions on behalf of our customers. So for me, not only is it a good business decision, but also it's just smart. It's just where we should be at at this point in our in, in time. But, you know, to answer your question, I think there's so much that can be done. And people get very, especially in America, you know, the, the conversations are so forbidden, right? Nobody mm -hmm. knows the right language to use and everybody's scared of offending one another. Yeah. And I'm like, can we just stop that? Like, we have to be able to have the difficult conversations to be able to find the root cause of issues and figure out why in our organisations there isn't more equity. And so for me, I really am very forgiving around conversations in this space because I think unless we can make that easier for people, we're not going to actually address any of the problems. Yeah, creating safe space for conversation. Yeah, for sure. Without well, judgment. Without importantly. judgment. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about Good American specifically. Um, oh, good. Um, just kidding. My little no, just baby. Kidding. <laughs> um, what sets Good American apart from other fashion brands? Everything. <laughs> Samira, um, everything. <laughs> and how, well, you're going to tell us. And how do we prioritize diversity and inclusivity across uh, how do you prioritize diversity and inclusivity across all business models? Well, you know, I think the first thing to say is when I say everything's different at Good American, we kind of take it for granted that there's been such unbelievable forward trajectory mm -hmm. in the diversity, equity, and inc inclusion space in the mm -hmm. last six years, or certainly when Good American started business. Before we started, there were no companies. You would look at every single e-com, and every e-com was exactly the same. It was a size zero girl, and there was no diversity whatsoever. We were the first people to say, you know what, I wonder if customers might prefer seeing this on a butt that's a similar size to theirs. And lo and behold, they did, and they were twice as likely to convert, actually. So these again were sound business decisions yes it took more time yes it was more expensive yes it was difficult for a startup business to do but actually we reap the rewards of that from our customer base and so I think about that first and foremost like you have to do everything differently I was very very um and I have to say uh Natalie Massonet who's sitting in the audience said to me you know like don't compromise. Like, if you have a purpose, like, don't compromise on your vision. And I was like, well, maybe I need to compromise a bit to get some stuff done. But actually, it was the right thing. It was the right advice. Because when we went and had those meetings with retailers and we went and we spoke to factories, mm -hmm. we were like, you can only be in business with us if you do the following things. And those things were buying all of the sizes, zero, zero, through a plus size 24, putting everything together in one section of the department store. It seems like nothing, but at the time it was revolutionary. And for certain customers, they had never seen that before. They have to go up to like floor five and in some danky little corner find like a yeah. dress cut on the bias with a big piece of ruching on it. And yeah. there was just nothing. And so I was like, well, I wonder if you gave her like a black vinyl skinny pant can in a size 18 if she would buy it well of course she would they've yeah. just never given the option yeah. so again just changing the the preconceived notion of what a certain woman would want at a certain size and doing everything differently and without you know worrying about you know our business of course was set up in the beginning we were made to be you know, in this inclusive space. We weren't trying to retrofit. And so a lot of businesses who have tried to do it the other way around, you know, have faltered. But we were essentially engineered to be this way from the beginning. And by being true to ourselves, doing less, actually going slower than we thought we should, um, those decisions turned out to be the right ones for our customers. And that having that 
customer-centric and customer-first mindset, never ever deviating from the purpose of the business is actually what's made us super successful. Can you tell us a little bit about the open casting call and <laughs> how that has been really, because that's been really effective yeah. well, for Well, they you. weren't like plus size moldable. So again, yeah. these things seem revolutionary. It's actually but really <laughs> interesting. <laughs> no, it was just, um, it was a, a need. You know, I couldn't afford to book Ashley Graham six years ago because we had no money and we were a startup and she was like a one of one. Right. And so we had to go out and again, it was trying to think outside the box. If you can't find people to be the face of your brand and you're talking about creating for all women and mm -hmm. doing something something with a sense of purpose and meaning around what it means to be and live in a certain body, we were like, well, maybe our customers would want to come and actually model for us. So it really was that naive in the beginning. We were like, we have no funds. <laughs> we really need people to do this. And they need to look like they were scooped up from the streets of New York. And we were like, oh, Maybe we just go on the streets and get them. And so it was, you know, something that started out very naive. But what we realized is that people love to be invited into this conversation. They love to be part of what they perceive as a movement that is really, truly representative of them. Mm -hmm. And so the open casting call, again, it was a, a means to an end. But now we're in our sixth year of the open casting call. We had 75,000 women enter this year, which is a lot of emails for those of you who <laughs> care about that kind of email capture stuff. But, you know, it was, again, it was a tool that worked for the business that actually turned out to be fantastic in terms of customer ac acquisition, but more importantly, brought people into the brand, into the essence of what we do. And again, you know, works really, it was just a, a really positive thing. And we get amazing content out of it. I love doing it. We've been all over the world and met the best people. But these people turn into advocates for our brand, you know, and they're there for the, for the long haul. So we've touched upon authenticity. We've touched upon community. You really are banging them out. Yeah. <laughs> no, but these are all really key points, right? Authenticity, community, not uh, going back on your vision, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what do you view as some of the biggest challenges for the next generation of entrepreneurs? So that's one part of the question, you know, as you're at this, this moment in your career. And what do you think we could all do um, to help sort of tackle those problems? For entrepreneurs specifically, you know, it's so interesting. I was talking <clears throat> to somebody about this um, last night and you know we were, we were actually having a conversation about like the culture of entitlement really we're going to get into a really sticky subject now um and and how i really believe that that's adversely affecting women you know so many of the women that i work with they sit around they're on social media looking mm -hmm. at instagram they're looking at tiktok and there is this idea um that you know you Let's think how to put this really nicely. You know, it's like... You that, don't have to. Safe well, space. You know, that like working hard, coming into the office every single day, grinding it out. Mm -hmm. There is this sense of entitlement that perpetuates in, in social media. And it disproportionately hits women than men. So when I think about my workforce, which is wildly and predominantly women mm -hmm. and how you know the the kind of system works around HR and who might need space and a different way of working it's all happening in the female community of workers and it isn't affecting the guys as much and so it's really really interesting to me because I think that you know in 50 years we've come so far as women we have so many incredible female entrepreneurs and all mm -hmm. of these in brilliant role models but it sometimes kind of feels feels to me like it's like skipping a generation. And so I think like oh. having some honest conversation about what it really takes to be successful. You know, the question I get asked all the time is like, how do you balance it? Oh, you're a mum of four and you have all of these businesses. I'm like, it's called a trade-off. It's called like, I don't see my friends as much as I might want to. And again, I think this idea of social media and what it means to be successful sometimes unfairly um, shows women the wrong thing. Like every day, my life is a trade-off. I was on the Today Show this morning, so I didn't take my kids to school. I'm here talking to you, so I wouldn't pick them up. I mean, I wouldn't anyway, because I'm new. <laughs> my kids are in LA. But you get what I'm talking yeah, about, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. every single day, yeah. there's something yeah. that I don't yeah. do in one place yeah. in my life because I'm doing it in another yeah. place in my life. And I think just like some honesty around 
the journey of being an mm -hmm. entrepreneur or the journey of being mm -hmm. a successful woman at woman in a in any way shape or form is probably what's needed because i think we're setting people up for failure making people think you have to look a certain way and be a certain way and present a certain Absolutely. thing that everything's going to work out in your life like you don't be like the perfect mother and a model entrepreneur and have an amazing husband like at some point something has to give and at some point there is a bit of a trade off yeah, I always say that the greatest lie women have been told is that you can have it all. It's I mean, you, it's degrees. Degrees. Prioritize. You can have it all, but like not all at the same time. Like yeah. You've got to pick yeah. and choose, right? Yeah. And there's times in my life when I've been more focused on one thing and times when I'm more focused on another thing. But I think about what's, like, what is really affecting women at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's this idea that we should all be like so entitled and that you wake up and everything, all the obstacles should be out of your way and that anxiety is like a really bad thing so I feel anxiety all the time like at some, at some point in the day these are normal natural human feelings and I think if we think that all of that you know we should just sail through life and everything should be like hunky-dory then we're really lying to ourselves and we're really not being fair to each other as women. Do you at this point with all of these successful businesses that you have do you still feel that anxiety? Oh yeah yeah, all the time. Like, not so much. Uh, it's different, right? Mm -hmm. It, like, moves to different <laughs> places in your in your body and in yeah, your yeah. world. You know, I'm not worried if I'm going to sell any jeans today. That's for sure. That will work out. <laughs> but, you know, there's other things that you, that you worry about. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've just gone through, uh, you know, a global pandemic. None of us saw that coming. Mm -hmm. I certainly wasn't, you know, ready to navigate a company through that moment. You live and you learn and you grow. And, you know, inevitably you get a lot of things wrong. That's, you know, and I think to just be honest and fallible and, you know, I feel like knowing what you don't know is one of the biggest lessons that I've learned. And I also think so much about this idea of transforming on the way up. The company that I run three years ago is not the same company that I run today. And so really figuring out how you transform your business on the way up, how things change. It wasn't so important when I started for me to be B Corp certified. Four kids later and, you know, understanding the impact and what's happening mm -hmm. in the world, that became an absolute necessity and a priority for Good American. And so um, I think it's really just trying to you know, be honest and be clear about what you're doing and understanding that those benchmarks are going to change all the time. I want to talk about failure because you've mentioned it a few times and it's something that I um, have been sort of thinking about a lot li lately. Um, and I'd, I'd love to know... You're not failing, Samira. You're killing it right now. Well, you thanks. Know. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, no, but it, I, I guess my question is, is failure always a bad thing? is one question. And then how do you define it? How do, would you define failure? And uh, how do you mitigate it? And how do you lead through it? I mean, I wonder if I'm the person to answer that question. I haven't mitigated it, really. Um, do you think it's a it's bad never, thing? You know, no, I mean, it's not like during it, it feels like a bad thing. <laughs> you know, it's like it's, hindsight is a fine thing. Mm -hmm. I look back on all of the failures and I'm very good at taking things out of any situation. I'm also an eternal optimist you know I don't know I failed until I really 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 failed because I always think things can turn around um but I think it's just part of life you know it's part of what you do and actually you know everything that hasn't worked out so well for me I've been able to take some element out of it and learn and right. you know every business that you know I work on or become involved in we're taking learnings from mm -hmm. one and moving over to another arguably we could never have had the success that we've seen in skims had I not spent six years figuring out how to do inclusive fashion in 19 sizes at Good American right it's like we we learned that we uniquely learned it um, and so I, I think about the failures as just opportunities to like get better. And you know, I'm, I mourn the failures and I move on really quickly. It's like, you know, I'm a very like forward looking person. <laughs> it's like I just like get, just go through it. And does it give way to new, uh, new ideas and new like business ideas specifically? Yeah, I think it does, actually, especially when you're in, you know, I consider myself a product person. That's what I mm -hmm. do. You know, it's like I change clothes five times a day. I'm always wear testing new fabrics. It's like and, and I often think about what doesn't work. Like I'm trying to solve problems right through fabric innovation and through doing things like different from a pattern point of view. And so it often stems from somebody saying to me, hey, you know, like your jeans like 
are chafing me because my thighs rub together and this is the size I am and that's a problem. I'm like, okay, well, then that's, a, that's something that we need to go out and solve for. So I, I think about those things again. Everything is an opportunity. You can choose to ignore it mm -hmm. or you can choose to, like, embrace those customers and those challenges and go after things. And I'm just a go-after-it type of girl. Love it. You heard it here first. Um, I want to talk about mentorship. Um, have you always had a mentor? How do you seek mentorship out? And are you constantly sort of looking to mentor others? You know, that is a great question. I never really knew the term growing up. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know anybody that owned a business when I grew up. I had like a distant uncle that was a car mechanic, but it didn't really count. So there was nowhere to look it's a for. But it was a business, it's a business. you know. Um, but I didn't know where to go for mentorship. It was mm -hmm. much, much later in my career. Um, and I would self-appoint my mentors. They were never really people that came to me, I was like, hi, Natalie Massonet, my client, like, want to be my mentor? No? Okay, well, I'm going to make that happen anyway. But, you know, it's like I just <laughs> used to, like, drag information out of people and book meetings for nothing and see if they would very generously, Natalie did, but very generously spend time with me. And I think as I've got older, that becomes easier because we're now in a culture where actually people enjoy helping. They enjoy having that interaction. People want to be seen to be sharing the information and sharing the love. And of course, I get it a lot coming this way, right? It's like now that we have social media, mm -hmm. it's like every day I get emails and DMs and, you know, every now and again... I would say every other week I probably jump on the phone with someone and, you know, sometimes I'm so surprised. There was a woman in my office two weeks ago. Uh, my assistant was like, you have to meet this woman and she's so incredible. And I said, oh, can you show me something on your Shopify? And she's done like $60 million. And I hadn't really done my research because I was like, of course I'm going to help you. And I was like, oh, like you're really in it. Okay, this, this is a different meeting. And so I do. I try, to, I try to meet as many people as I can because I think that benefit of information mm -hmm. is everything it's so powerful you know when I look at the people around me you know oftentimes they went to school together their families knew each other it's just you know it's it's very small at mm -hmm. the top and I think that when you don't know anyone and when that idea of having a conversation about finance let alone raising finance but just the yeah. very idea of speaking about money isn't something that comes naturally to you or you've had had any training for um that becomes an enormous roadblock and so sometimes it's just about demystifying uh, some of the information. And I almost think about it as a as a responsibility at a certain level of success mm -hmm. it's kind of your job to like help some people right and you can do that in a myriad of different ways but it's like if you're a great business person why wouldn't you share yeah. some of the love why wouldn't you share some of the learnings um and so I encourage that in every part like even in my businesses you know I was on Shark Tank and I have all of these incredible young entrepreneurs and founders that I've invested in and I'm like oh you have a problem on your e-com come in you can meet my chief revenue officer he's got Plenty of time to chat to you, you know, but it's like, it's very, like, rewarding and fulfilling for people. And I think it is a really, um, it's something that we've got really right in America, like the yeah. idea that you're going to pay it forward. And so, yeah, I think the, the long answer is yes to mentors, yes to more of them. Some people got it right and pay it forward. Have you ever come across someone where you're like, oh, my God, this person has it. I'm going to do everything I can to, like... You know, because sometimes in my work, like, you just meet someone that's just trying to find their way, but they have the thing. It's like mm -hmm. that, that, like, not definable, indescribable yeah. thing. Have you come across that? Whether you remember, you know Lynette Nylander, right? Do you know Lynette? She was, uh, she, she was my intern. I saw her oh, last yeah, night. Lynette, she was yeah. here yeah. at the Fashion Tech Forum. She was my intern when she was, like, 17, and I knew immediately. I couldn't even pay her. Um, it's gone full circle, and six, 17 years later, she's actually working with me again on a new big project, and I found her original offer letter from 17 oh, years ago. It was disgraceful what we were paying. <laughs> um, I will tell you, but, you know, for me, I was like, wow, this is a girl. You know, she made it all the way to the helm of Teen Vogue, and, you know, it was amazing, and that's the person where mm -hmm. I was like, this kid is, like, going to be a superstar, like, you know. So, yeah, Lynette, I'm, I'm sad she's not here, but that, that was one. Where do you go for inspiration? 
because I always think that these these ideas, these businesses, and I could be wrong, mm -hmm. but they come from dreaming, being out in the world, thinking, seeing how things aren't working or working, and then they lead to the to yeah. the idea. So dreaming. where do you? Yeah, I really feel like that. It's where like do you go I, for inspiration? I really believe that you can, you know, manifest things in your life, and I think that to a certain extent, mm -hmm. um, I also had like a lot of luck and a lot of opportunities that landed in the right way. But I do think that. I manifested a lot of these things. It's like, you know, what do they say? They say, like, luck is where opportunity meets, meets preparation. And I was, like, prepared as they get, you know, for, for when my opportunities, like, come. But I always. do think... You've just always been that person. Always. Like, always. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 100%. But you reap what you sow, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, I feel like I've done a lot of things right in my career. You know, mm -hmm. it's like I've... I, I was in London. I was assisting absolutely, you know every designer that was out there and I was like really nice I was always the one who stayed late I was never an arsehole it's like I've always yeah. treated people well and it comes you know back around to you it doesn't take very much but I think in this industry where there was some kind of kudos to you being an arsehole right that that nice people didn't really uh exist that much and then when you found them or when you find them they really really stand out so I think about that every day I think you get what you give in life yeah and I try to be like a you know like a good girl and a nice person and it and it works out most of the time and and inspiration you find you know I find world? inspiration absolutely everywhere I'm lucky that I'm surrounded with really great people I hate that I mean I kind of find my husband quite inspiring you know he says things he reads everything and it's like you know if you're in a relationship with someone for six years you ought to find them inspiring but yeah. I get it from I get it from everywhere you know it's like from the kids I had all my nieces and nephews here in New York last week and they showed me like a whole different New York you know like a 13, 14, 15, and a 16-year-old, you're going to places you never, that I would never go to. But I find, you know, again, I'm a naturally curious person. Mm -hmm. I find inspiration in everything, and I find everyone interesting. That's the truth. How, I want to, again, I want to switch gears a little bit. I'm trying to be mindful of time, and I have no idea where we're at, but no, someone will You can't, me. conveniently can't, can't rationally can't see, see the so time. Someone will like <laughs> They're like, your time's up. Oh, I'm supposed to wrap up? Get out of here. I have so many cards. <laughs> <laughs> Samira, come okay, on. Okay, you okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, let's talk about business a little bit. How do you assess the companies that you invest in? Mm -hmm. um, and does the founder and or the founding team uh, of the company come into play? When yeah, evaluating me, a potential investment. To me, it's always about the founder because there's so many great ideas and I get so many uh, pitches mm -hmm. come across my uh, inbox all the time. Um, and often surprisingly similar, right? You'll be surprised at like, really? the same people. Yeah, it's like, you know, there's like a lot of amazing things happening in AI at the moment. And so yeah. all the things that come across my desk are, you know, with some kind of AI integration. Um I am very founder-led. It's like I want to go for the person that I really believe in. And, um, you know, I, I really do think about exceptional individuals being able to do things that otherwise, it's you know, it's not just about money. It's not just about means. You really need an exceptional viewpoint and some kind of, like, stand out something that's intangible often. And they're, they're the people that I tend to go for. So it's not, it's just an, it's something when you meet the person that yeah, makes I mean, you believe Yeah, I mean, look, of, co of course, you know, you want an amazing pitch and somebody who's figured out how to turn a profit and, you know, is going to use capital in a really smart way. But at the end of the day, there are lots of smart people out there and there's mm -hmm. no shortage of money. And I think that, you know, for me, it always comes down to someone that I can feel some, you know, that I relate to and I get it. And of course, if I can be helpful in that business in a way beyond just giving funds then that's also very interesting to me too because I, lo I love a startup um, <laughs> I would just start new businesses every week if I could and if I had the capacity but yeah it's often just that intangible thing and me feeling that with somebody I always say that uh, our differences are our gifts mm -hmm. do you think that applies to entrepreneurship yeah 100% it really is because you having a certain lens and a viewpoint that somebody else isn't going to have about something is the difference between success and failure, right? It can be exactly the same idea, but you having a unique viewpoint on how to bring that thing to life is is absolutely the difference. Yeah, I agree. I love that. Um, 
All right, I'm going to wrap it up with one question. And it's really annoying that I'm asking this question because we don't ask men these questions. Oh, we no, you're going to ask me the balance question, the big well, B. Well, because I just, because, you know, until we, you know, for some women, it is such a, it is a struggle. Shall I answer the question without you asking it? So you don't, you have, you can spare the audience for the balance question. I will say that nobody ever asks boys this question, but it's fine. No, um, I know, it's I true, think the I'm minute curious. as a woman that you yeah. stop looking for balance, right? So I'm very easy on myself. Mm -hmm. I don't like, you know, uh, I don't feel tremendously guilty that I might not be home tonight. I don't feel that bad that, you know, I'm not somewhere that my husband would want me to be tonight. I think that when I had my first kid, that was the first minute I felt real ambition. And that says a lot for me because wow. I think I was born ambitious. Because now it's like, oh, I have like a person to do it all for, mm -hmm. right? So I don't ever try to park one part of me to do the other thing. I think I'm teaching my kids that the idea of self-fulfillment, of you being happy as an individual, is part of what makes me a great mother. And so I'm kind of unapologetic about doing me. And I'm also not looking for balance because it's like if I have a sick kid, if I, I have a sick kid. If I have an emergency and something I need to deal with in work, then that's what I'm focused mm -hmm. on. And if I went through my day every day trying to find some, in, like, balance, I'd never, I'd never be done. I'd never be happy. So I'm just a little bit forgiving of myself. Mm -hmm. I'm like, today I'm going to do, like whatever it is that I'm going to do, and I'm not going to torture myself about it, but I just don't try to look for, like, the 100% perfection. I'm over it. It's never coming. Stop. I have one more question. I know I said that. It was going to be the last one, but it's not. Sorry. Just one more. I'll be quick. I know. Everyone's doing this to me. Um, you said that you had, like, you've always had a plan, right? Like, you had your plan in your 20s. Yeah, I've so got the 40 plan what's now. The, it's what's the down. next? Like, what's next for you? What do you think? What's next that tell, you can share? Samira, you've got to tell people the plan. No, no you I am, um, you know, Ish. I think at a certain point, it's just, and again, living in this country in the past three years has been completely eye-opening to me. And if I think about my life, I never thought that I would, you know, live in LA, never thought I'd really live in America. Um, and I believe in that everything happens for a reason. I think mm -hmm. that I came here at this moment because I was supposed to do something and it wasn't selling knickers or jeans, funnily enough. And so I actually think about, you know, higher purpose. Like how could somebody like me who came from East London and didn't finish school and like had a level of success that was very acceptable to me even with my high level of ambition, how could you help a bunch of other people like me have opportunity and mm -hmm. that's what I think about most so I reckon the next 10 years will be focused around that area of progression in my life as opposed to it being like all about me like it's been for the last few years that's, that's the plan you heard it here first thank you very much thank you my thank